after St. Louis, the studio decided to use the title and did a movie called Ziegfeld Follies, based on the Broadway shows of the years before. And that was a series of songs and sketches. I was called on <clears throat> to do a revision of a sketch that had been used in the Follies on Broadway called Pay the Two Dollars. Originally, it was used by a great funny team called Willie and Eugene Howard. But in the movie, it was going to be for Red Skelton and Edward Arnold, a big, heavy set, straight man, character actor, played a hundred movies. And Skelton had been around now, and he was funny. So I rewrote the movie, which was, not the movie, the sketch, which is essentially a very funny idea. A lawyer is Arnold. He's with his client, Red Skelton. They're riding in the subway train, and Red Skelton, the client, is scolding his lawyer for having failed to do something in his behalf. He said, you call yourself a lawyer? and he goes, poof, and he spits. Instant later, the subway guard arrests him. He winds up in court where the judge finds him two dollars, and he is ready to pay. And Ed Arnold says, you can't pay. It's unfair. He had no right to do this. And he fights. He says, we're going to appeal it, so and so. And the fight goes on in court, and Ed Arnold prevails over the judge and says, OK, fine suspended. Get out of here. And they're back in the subway. And you know what happens. Red Skelton says, fine lawyer you are. Foo! And he spits. It's arrested again. That's the blackout. Called pay the two dollars. After that, I was called in to write a movie called The Land and the Thief, based on a, a treatment that Ludwig Bemelman, a foreign writer, a very good writer, had sold to Arthur Fried, the producer. I was shown the treatment, and I said, I, I don't believe this would make a movie. He said, you're going to have to write it. And then he mentioned the star, Lucille Bremer. Now, Lucille Bremer had played Rose in Meet Me in St. Louis, and to me, she was the world's worst actress, a piece of wood. But I happened to know that Freed was having an affair with her. And here he wants to make it the star of a movie I didn't want to write, so I f refused. He said, you're going to write it or you're going to get suspended. I said, OK, suspend me. I didn't care. I would make a lot of money for my radio show. But instead of that, I got a call from the head of the unit, who was a superior to Freed, a guy named Sam Katz, nice guy liked me. I said, what is it, Sam? He said, I understand that you don't want to write this movie for Lucille Bremer. I said, right. I said, I don't believe in the story. I know Fred Astaire is good, but Lucille Bremer is a leading woman. No way. Forget it. I'm out. He said, listen, we have to do it as a favor for Arthur. He's made us a lot of money, and we know we can't make any money with this. But he's having a little, and he winked, hanky-panky with this actress. And we're willing to let him blow some money as kind of a present for the money he's made us. So I want you to write it. I said, 
I don't want, I don't want to be associated with it. Turkey, he said, oh, by the way, how much salary are we paying you now? I said, 1750 a week, why? And he leaned forward, he said, what? I didn't hear, did you say you're getting 2500 a week? I said, I guess I said that, yeah. He said, well, fine, we'll leave it at 2500 a week, only we'll give you a four-year firm contract. Now go away and write it. I took the bribe. I went and I wrote it. Only this time, I couldn't work with Manelli because Manelli had said such terrible things before Garland had, re, had uh, said she wasn't going to do the movie. He just foul-mouthed her in such a way he couldn't face me now. You know why? Because now he and she were getting married. Somehow they'd fallen for each other. Somehow, I don't know what went on, but he couldn't face me with embarrassment. So he directed the movie very well. He's a fine director. He directed St. Louis beautifully. And the movie came out got some good reviews for some parts of it, the dialogue, I would call, and the stairs dancing. Nothing for grammar. And overall, the movie died. Now it's a big hit in Europe, has been for years. It's what they call a cult classic. And that's the story of my certain movies. I, I wrote other movies. I enjoyed doing The Thin Man with the Marx Brothers. And uh, I, uh, I wrote other movies after I left MGM. I wrote, uh, I directed a movie I liked very much called Sail the Crooked Ship with Robert Wagner, Ernie Kovacs, and Carolyn Jones. That was a very funny movie. I enjoyed directing. I, I did a lot of writing without credit because there was no script, but a very good writer named Ruth Flippin got credit and deserved it. Somebody loves me. I, I don't look back on that with great happiness, and I'll explain why. I was asked to write this movie for Betty Hutton, who I thought was a very good performer, and I wrote I was also to direct it. I wrote the script, which Paramount liked very much. It was produced by Pearlberg and George, Bill Pearlberg and George Seaton. George Seaton is a friend of mine and a very good writer-director. Then they started casting. And when they told me they wanted to cast an actor called Ralph Meeker, I looked at some film on Ralph Maker, and I had seen some, and I said, oh no, no way. He cannot play a musical comedy singer, dancer, and I has, he has no sex appeal opposite Betty Hutton. And they said, well, we can't seem to find anybody. I said, then don't make the movie till you find somebody. We gotta make the movie. I said, please, I beg you. Now at that time, I had only directed one film called The Life of Riley a few years before. And I hadn't any stature as an important director. I was recognized as a writer, fine. They were complaining about the script, but they didn't listen to me. They ignored my pleading, and we took this lox. Lox is a Swedish word for smoked salmon. We took this long slab of smoked salmon as leading man 
And I can only tell you that the ordinary slab of smoked salmon in a delicate fashion takes in more money than the movie did. Well, I'm exaggerating. It took in a few bucks. It got pretty good reviews, except when it came to the leading man. They panned him. It really was too bad. So the movie was not a hit and didn't deserve to be because he was just, just nothing. I was called in by Columbia by a producer named Fred Colmar. He said, we've got a couple of scripts on Bye Bye Bury. We bought the show, which was a hit, but we can't make it because we don't have a real good end, the last few reels. We can't seem to get it. Have you ever seen the show? I said, no. He said, it's closing tomorrow in Chicago, the road show. That was New Year's Eve tomorrow. He said, will you fly there and look at the show and see if you can think of a way to lick this thing, to get us an ending? If so, I want you to, to write it. I did. I hated to leave town for New Year's Eve, but I went there. I was met by an executive from Columbia, and we went to see the show. It was a nice show, good songs. Dick Van Dyke was nice. There was no ending, they just petered out with songs. And I went back home on the plane. On the plane, I was thinking about it, and I got an idea, I thought, maybe. I got to Hollywood, went home, and the next day, I went in to see the producer. I said, I got an idea I think will make some kind of an ending. He said, what, what? I said, well, you know, Dick Van Dyke is an English teacher. I said, and I don't see how his being an English teacher has anything to do with how the picture ends up. And it's not even good plotting to have him in a character that doesn't pay off. His character should be responsible for how the picture ends. And it doesn't. He said, you're right, that's what's wrong with it, our damn thing. So what do you say? I said, this may be crazy. And then I, I launched into, I said, they got a little son, the family, Paul Lynn's got a little boy. I said, I want him to have a chemical set. And why? I said, I want Dick Van Dyke to be a chemistry professor. That's his, his life's work. And when he's arguing with the father about having Conrad Birdie sing and kiss his daughter, which the father is outraged by, he, he says to him, I've got an invention. What business are you in? He says, well, I sell fertilizer. <laughs> and of course he gets laughed. I'm into fertilizer, Paul Lynn says. I love Paul Lynn. And he said, suppose you could sell a fertilizer that made chickens or cows produce more. Cows produce more milk quicker. And chickens, if, instead of laying one egg a day, they lay two or three. He said, oh, it's ridiculous. How? He said, I have a developed a chemical that I've been experimenting on with a couple of little animals, and I call it speed up. Well, what about it? He said, well, if, if it could speed up the Russian orchestra at the end of the movie, so they play faster, that would leave time for Conrad Birdie 
to sing because right now Ed Sullivan, the producer of the show, says there's no room for Bertie to sing. And then he takes out a pill. He says, let me see what happens here. And the little boy is playing with a big turtle, a live turtle. And Paul Linder gives the turtle the pill, stuffs it down his mouth, a little white pill. And they forget about it. And they talk some more, and a couple of minutes, son, hear, they hear a rattle. And they see a turtle flying across the floor, faster than any turtle ever went. And they know they got something. They don't know how much. Now the movie goes on, and when it comes time, hopefully, for Bertie to get a, a fraction of a second, maybe, Maybe the Russian conductor refuses to cut Swan Lake Ballet and allow some couple of minutes for Conrad Bertie to sing Just One More Kiss and kiss Anne Margaret. So that's what happened. Janet Lee traps the Russian composer or conductor into drinking a glass of milk into which they drop this drug. And he drinks it, and when they play the ballet, very slow and methodical, all of a sudden the pill takes hold, the Russian's eyes cross, and he starts raising the baton faster than any baton ever raised. And all the dancers on the stage try to keep up with it. And they go crazy. They drop from exhaustion. They're, they run in a fantastic, quick motion. And the audience screams with laughter. Ed Sullivan starts to laugh. The Russians go crazy. Conrad Bertie gets on. There's time for him now because the others stop dancing. And he starts to say, sing just one more kiss to Anne Margaret. And uh, the little, the, the juvenile lead, a singer named John, uh, R Bobby Rydell, jumps up and just before Conrad Bertie is going to kiss Anne, Margaret. Bobby punches him in the jaw and knocks him out. And the leading man and Janet Lee get together, sing a song, happy end of movie. But I have to tell you that the movie would not have been as successful. It was a tremendous grocer it hadn't been for the presence of Ann Margaret. Now, Ann Margaret, they had never heard of. But when we were busy casting and had no la leading lady, I had said to them, I'd been up to, Palm, to uh, Las Vegas to spend some time with my friend George Burns, who was appearing there on stage. And there was a young singer who played, went on ahead of him, and I thought she was beautiful and sang well. If she could act, you ought to think about her. So they brought her down. And this time, without any Judy Garland nonsense, I read a couple of pages with her, and she was great, and she was in, and she became a star. And I was glad of that. Somebody else would have picked her up, but I was the one who was happy to have done it. Unfortunately, with all the lady and ladies, I never had any sex except with Cleo the Basset Hound, who licked my hand. Cleo the Basset Hound was the star of a TV series I did called People's Choice with Jackie Cooper. 
That was in the 50s. I went back to TV after Bye Bye Birdie. There were two reasons. I'm not, I'm not sure that either reason is good enough to excuse why I didn't continue. But I know one thing, that by the time I was in the 60s, movies were getting to use language that made me uncomfortable. I personally, in private life, may use the same language, but I was not comfortable typing it out. Four-letter words and ten-letter words and whatever. And that kind of cooled me a little. And the other thing that was more personal, I was having serious problems with a child who has since passed away, who was a, at that time in his 30s, who was not well emotionally and causing me great heartbreak to the point where I had no desire to sit and try to be funny. I should have fought it, but I didn't. So I really didn't pursue what I had been doing with, with reasonable success. I really, I could probably not, never be a teacher. I could be somebody who could advise, correct, amplify, inject, but I don't think I could be a teacher because I never, I never was aware that I had a process that worked except thinking about closing my eyes most of the time, thinking about what I would like to see up on the screen. Now that sounds silly, but what I mean is I would, let's say in the Marx Brothers, I know that I had to tell a story. Now in Go West, it was about three guys who go west, obviously, in a period. So I would start generally thinking about it. And my thinking was always, without plan, kind of random. I try to tell myself the Marx Brothers get west, they're broke, how do they survive? I know that the Marx Brothers have to take over the picture, but you have to somehow hook what they're involved in with the, the lives of the leading man and woman. So I had a very, I thought, ordinary type of storyline, namely that some railroad company wanted to buy up right away from some poor prospector who might who did own a deed to the right of way, whatever the hell that meant. And with that in mind, I fell upon a little idea that he had a granddaughter who lived out there, and she had a boyfriend, probably a cowboy or whatever. And the Marx Brothers, when they got out there, would somehow get involved with the deed, get a hold of the deed, and take it to the young woman. In the meantime, some bad guys were trying to get the right of way and, and get rich. I thought of a scene 
at Penn Station, New York, where Groucho meets two brothers, namely Chico and Harple, two little thieves. And Groucho is a wise guy with his big bag, typically a sharpshooter heading west. And they con him out of a $10 bill in a, in a scene that turned out very funny, where each time he handed them the bill and they give him change, they retrieve the bill out of his pocket without his knowing it. It's funnier on the screen than sitting here. Anyway, from that, they moved on. And they join forces, and they wind up meeting the young girl. Right after they get west, I do a parody of Stagecoach, where they get in to a stagecoach, and where there's a prostitute, obviously dressed as such, and the, the villain-to-be a man from who wants to buy up the land, a crook, and the three Marx Brothers, all crammed in, and a woman with a baby, crying baby, all tightly packed into the thing, and the activity is turns out to be very funny. When they get into town, there's now more storyline about the the deed which had now been stolen by the heavies, and Groucho's got to somehow retrieve it, gets knocked around by the villain, there's comedy in the saloon, and the high spot of the movie, and they always, in my opinion, always need an ending that they take away. I was happy or lucky to come up with an ending where it becomes necessary for the Marx Brothers to reach a certain point. The ones who get there with the deed are in business. That's pretty much it, poorly stated. And so you have a situation where the heavies have a very fast-going buggy, two-seater, with fast horses. The Marx Brothers have a railroad train that eventually runs out of coal. And the Marx Brothers have to be ingenious enough. They start taking apart the entire rest of the train, the freight train, they break it to pieces and they burn the wood into the engine so that people are exposed sitting there with no walls on the train. The train goes crazy. <laughs> Eventually, there's very little left but flat cars and an engine. And the Marx Brothers, through their cleverness, win the race. Having won the race, the leading man and his girl get the rights to the land, and you know they're going to be rich while they're making love in a cabin someplace. And the Marx Brothers are recognized for their, their triumph. In Meet Me in St. Louis, nobody remembers this, I'm sure. There's a scene after Christmas where the young man, Tom Grake, and Judy Garland have danced together at the Christmas party. And we've known that they've been in love with each other. Never touched each other, but they're in love. They're very, they're very young people. They're talking kind of nervously 
and with some kind of hope that they're going to be able to stay together. The story says she's moving to New York with her family. The family is leaving St. Louis. That's about the only plot in the movie, a plot point, major point. So they're not going to see each other, and they're, they're kidding each other that they're going to be getting together. He's going to go to college, and she's going to be in New York. And no, he will, he'll get a job. He'll come to New York. No, she doesn't think it'll work. It's a very tender, tough, very difficult scene. Where in the beginning, they're going to get married, and in the end, they're going to be separated. That kind of thing is the hardest for me to write. The easiest were comedy scenes, either monologue or dialogue. They were the easiest. I never, I never was stuck for more than a minute. That sounds very immodest, but I still can rattle off comedy, but I can't make up love scenes that, he, that good, that easy. No, they were the hardest by far. I had a very good relationship with, with Benelli until he got afraid to talk to me because of his his vilification of Judy before they got together. That was my best relationship. Most of the directors I had were not good, in my opinion. I, I didn't have fights with them, with one exception, not even a fight, but the director of the Marx Brothers who had directed one other picture I did called uh, Best Foot Forward was the other one. He directed that too, in a very pedestrian way. Uh, he had once been a, a, a second-rate comedian on Broadway. And he got in the movies when anybody who could show up with, became a director in the early days. He directed the Marx Brothers, and at the circus, I'll tell you one thing that could be of interest. There was a scene in, my, in the Atmos Circus where Yvonne is a woman who walks on the ceiling. She's an acrobat. She wears a leotard and does this stunt with vacuum shoes on the ceiling. She is part of the plot to steal money, and she has a stolen wallet with the leading man's money, which is vital for him to save the circus. Otherwise, if he can't get the money back, which has been stolen, he's going to lose his only possession, the circus. Real corny plot. She's got the wallet. Groucho plays a lawyer that's been brought to the circus by Chico, who loves the leading man and wants to help him survive. So Chico sends a telegram at the beginning, and up comes this shabby lawyer, who I gave the name J. Cheva Loophole. He comes, they make their connection, I get him into the plot. He sings a song called Lydia the Tattooed Lady, which became quite famous. It was a wonderful number. And the, the show goes on to a point where he now suspects that Eve Arden has the stolen money. So there's a scene where he's got to retrieve the money. The director calls the producer, Mervyn O'Roy, who then calls me 
and says, the director needs a line from Groucho that will affect, make it possible to make a move that's needed, which was absent in the script. Too hard to explain. Sometimes you need a covering line or something to, ch to be able to get a break and go forward. He says, go down and see what the problem is, will you, kid? So I go down and I said to Bazell, what's the problem? And he tells me so-and-so. So I think a minute, and I say, what if she's sitting on the couch and Groucho has been sitting next to her and he kind of dances away, kind of with his back to her, and out of the corner of his eye, he sees her snatch the wallet from under the cushion and put it down her cleavage and hide it. He said, that's okay. Now what? I said, now have Groucho walk up to the camera and look at it and say, there must be some way I can get that money back without getting in trouble with the Hayes office. Everybody on the set, including Groucho, laughed. Pazell looks at me, he says, you must be an idiot. I said, really? Why? He said, nobody knows what the Hayes office is. The audience will look like we're fools. I don't want it. I won't shoot it. Groucho said, I think it's pretty funny. He said, I won't shoot it. That's final. Big shot. I said, okay. Don't shoot it. I went to the phone. I called up Leroy. I said, I suggested a line. He didn't want to shoot it. What is it? I told him he takes, he sees the money go down her tits. And he says, and I quote the line. He said, I think it's funny. I'll send somebody down to shoot it. And in about 10 minutes, a director comes down, a guy I knew well, nice guy, S. Sylvan Simon. I tell him the line, I tell him the action. He says, let's go. In five minutes, he shot it. Shot it maybe a couple of times, get just right. End of story. Bazell didn't talk to me for a long time. A long time. Then we had a sneak preview in down the coast. I think it was Huntington Beach. Movie went very funny all the way. Biggest laugh in the picture, the Hayes office. The whole audience screamed. They all knew what the Hayes office was. Only the director didn't give him credit. Anyway, I had very few good directors. A, I was supposed to direct Bye Bye Birdie. And some, a situation arose which upset me, but I didn't blame him. When I, when I told him the end of the picture, what it would be, my agent said, it's understood that we're going to make a deal to, for Irv to direct. And Colmar said, yes, I'll take it upstairs. And then as it came shooting time, I hadn't even gotten started on that. Colmar called me in and he was practically in tears. He said, Irv, I'm not a Welcher. I don't like going back on my word, but there's a terrible situation here. Please bear with me. I said, what's the problem? He said, 
about you directly. He said, George Case, George Sidney has directed a number of pictures here. I, George was a friend of mine. I knew him. He's a very competent director. He said, and he's got a contract, and they had paid him a lot of money for his next picture. They gave him the cash, and the picture was dumped. They didn't want to do it. And there's nothing for him to shoot to cover that money. He said, I think it was a hundred grand. And they want him to shoot Bye Bye Birdie. I said, oh, sh shit. I said, I wanted to do this movie because I like it. I said, I really have a, almost a temptation to give you your money back for the script and take it. He said, I doubt if you get away with that, but would you try to understand? I felt sorry for him, but I felt very angry. And I did back off. And George directed it, and I thought he did a competent job. I, I can't, I can't fault him. I, I came down the set a few times. He asked me for certain things, and we remained friends. And it was the biggest thing he ever did. It revived his career. Now what else? You want to know why I don't go to the movies? <laughs> First of all, I can't see, and I might be lucky because the movies, from what I hear, are mostly not very good. A lot of them have the feeling of long TV shows with a lot of talk and not a lot of interesting action and, and not a lot of wit, a lot of shock, a lot of dirty words. I haven't heard many people, including my wife, who loves movies, rave about movies anymore. And that's sad. It's really sad. When you were writing actively, um, and even now maybe, did you, um, did you get up in, early in the morning? I mean, what was your routine, your writing routine for the day? It was to get up early when I felt strongest and go to a closed area where there was hopefully no noise. Noise distracted me. I had a special office at MGM that was almost soundproof. Anyway, uh, that's what I did. I went there and put my head in my hands and started to ponder. Sometimes you're lucky enough that the night before you, you had gotten something that intrigued you and you couldn't wait to go on with it. Didn't happen that often, but it did happen enough. Comedy, I don't think, can be taught. I may be wrong, but I don't think you can teach it. I, I think, a, I think a, a comic can learn from watching and maybe stealing a little from another comic and possibly a writer wanting to be funny can read S.J. Perelman and parody him as possible. But the writer, the real writers aren't taking from anybody. It comes, a dirty word, gift. It's a gift. And you've got to be lucky if you got it. Goodbye, young writers, wherever you are. I hope at gainful employment, writing hit movies. But as I said, until that happens, keep your day job. And bless you all.